Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib, and we're taking a look today at another mini PC, this one from Azul. This is actually one of those PCs on a stick. This is their Access 4, and it's powered by one of the newer Gemini Lake J4125 processors and runs Windows 10. What's nice about this one is that it's got built-in gigabit ethernet. And we're going to be taking a closer look at this computer and what it's all about in just a second. But I do want to let you know, in the interest of full disclosure, that this is on loan from Azul. So when we're done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this little mini PC is all about. Now, the price point on this one is $269 with Windows installed. There is a version without Windows and just Linux that costs a little bit less. Now, as I mentioned, this has a J4125 processor installed from Intel. That, of course, will run Windows and Linux just fine. It has, though, only 4 gigs of RAM and 64 gigs of storage, and you can't upgrade either one of those things. So that's one limitation with this. Uh, but it is fanless, so if you like a PC that doesn't make any noise, this one might be worth taking a look at. It does use the outer casing as a heat sink, so you'll probably want to get it oriented in such a way that both the top and bottom are clear so you can get some uh, natural airflow around it. This will throttle itself the hotter it gets because the only way it can cool itself down is to not generate as much heat. And we'll take a look at its thermal performance a little bit later in the video. Now this is designed to plug directly into a display, into an HDMI port, but they do include an HDMI extension cable, which is what I would recommend for most use cases. The reason is, is that it is pretty heavy and it's putting a lot of weight on the connector of your monitor. So I would just plug in one of those extender cables. Uh, the one that comes with it should work well enough for that. And that'll give you a little bit less of a strain on the connector. It does support 4K up to 60 Hertz. So that's a good thing. Although these Gemini Lake processors aren't so great at running 4K video. So this may not be a good solution for home theaters and that sort of thing. So let's take a look at the ports on this thing. On the left hand side, you've got a micro SD card slot here for augmenting its onboard storage. That might be useful given the limited amounts of storage that it has built in. You have a USB 3 port next to it. Uh, you've got your barrel connector here for power if you want to use that. But you also on the other side have a USB type C connector. And this also supports power delivery. So you could plug in a USB-C power source and use that instead. Now I was hoping to connect up a docking station to this. I've got a bunch of docks here on the channel that work with USB-C computers. And those docks are really useful because you can connect a single cable and then get a whole bunch of additional ports that you can use on the dock. And the dock provides power, you get display out, you get data devices going back and forth, all is good. Except on this device, once it detects power on that USB-C connector, it disables the display and data functions. And that was the case with every single USB-C dock I tested with it. Uh, as an example, this is one that I use from time to time here on the channel, and it has a uh, power connector here on the back. And if you plug USB-C power in and hook it up to the port, the computer boots up, but nothing on this dock works. And then I shut down, pulled the power out of the dock, connected up the barrel connector, and then powered things back on with the dock connected. And once it came back up, the HDMI worked, the Ethernet worked, and the USB worked. So for whatever reason, when this USB-C port detects power, it disables all the other functions of its USB-C port. So that was a bit of a disappointment. On the back here, we've got a headphone microphone jack. You got gigabit ethernet and a Kensington lock. So you can lock it down on a desk with one of those Kensington kits. And if ethernet's not your thing, you can use the Wi-Fi antenna here to connect to your wireless network. Uh, this supports AC Wi-Fi. So it has all the latest and greatest from a network connectivity standpoint. And of course, you could use both of these things at the same time. You could connect to two different networks or load balance or whatever else you want to do. So lots of connectivity options on this one. So let's boot this thing up now and see how it performs. All right, so we got it booted up now here running on the desk. I did connect up Ethernet and I'm running the display out of the USB-C port with a USB-C to HDMI adapter. So we could still plug in a second display to the HDMI connector on the front if we wanted to. And the good news here is that we are getting the display to run here at 60 hertz according to Windows. So all is good and we're scaling this at 200% so I can actually see what is on the screen. Uh, so all is good there. Let's take a quick look at the 
Ethernet adapter on this thing and see if it can handle gigabit speeds. I recently upgraded my internet connection to a symmetrical multi-gigabit connection, and of course this only has a gigabit connector on board, uh, but we should see speeds at above 900 megabits per second back and forth to the internet, and it looks like the built-in ethernet is able to achieve that here, so all good on the network connector. So let's take a look at its web browsing performance now. We'll boot up the Chrome browser. Uh, that we installed a little while back and go over to the nasa.gov homepage. And again, we're on Ethernet right now, so things will be a little bit quicker perhaps than they would be on Wi-Fi. But as you can see, the page here renders in pretty quickly. This is about in line with what we've seen from other Gemini Lake computers like this one, and you're able to browse around the web here pretty efficiently. You will notice a little bit of sluggishness as you're moving windows around and resizing at 4K. I found the sweet spot for these devices typically at 1080p, but if you do like the sharper text and graphics you get with a scaled 4K display, this will deliver it. It'll just feel a little bit slower than a more expensive PC might. But it does suffer quite a bit playing back 4K 60 video on YouTube. So we're running the Chrome browser again here. And as you can see, we're dropping a ton of frames as this video plays back. It lags quite a bit. It really has a hard time keeping up with 4K 60 video playback. So just be aware of that. Uh, one thing, though, that we did notice is that it does much better with 1080p content. So here's a video we shot a little bit earlier running a 1080p 60 video with no drop frames at the 1080p resolution. So I think the, again, sweet spot for these devices is running at uh, 1080p versus 4K because on the 4K side, you're definitely going to find yourself dropping a lot of frames and getting some jagged playback. Now these devices do not support HDR video, so while you can play 4K content, you're not going to get the HDR features out of this thing. Although if you do install the HEVC extensions and use the Windows App Store version of Netflix, you can get it to play back 4K Netflix content, just not all that well. And on version 2.0 of the BrowserBench.org speedometer test, we got a score of 42.7 which puts this pretty close in line to another J4125 machine we looked at recently from GMK, which scored 47. And you can see this one did a little bit better than the prior generation N4100 processors. And all in, it's not a bad browsing experience. But again, I would limit yourself uh, to basic web browsing at 4K and save the more robust stuff for 1080p. So let's move on now to some gaming. We've got Half-Life 2 running here first. This is 1080p. We're only getting, though, about 40 to 50 frames per second on this one, which is not great for this game. Usually you should see frame rates closer to 60, even on low-end Intel hardware with this title. Uh, Shovel Knight here did run a little better, but was struggling to reach 60 frames per second at times. This is one of those retro-inspired games. These typically do pretty well on these low-end Intel machines, but this one, again, uh, was struggling a bit to play Shovel Knight. And sometimes you can even coax something like GTA V to run at a decent frame rate on these little devices at low resolutions. But here we were running it at 720p, and we were at about 15 frames per second or so. Sometimes you can squeak out 20 to 25 and sometimes 30 even on some of these low-end Intel machines, but this one was struggling a bit on the graphical side. Uh, one thing, though, this might be useful for from a gaming perspective is retro game emulation. So if you're doing old arcade games or uh, some old console games from the 80s and 90s, this should be able to do that sort of thing fairly well. But the graphics performance here was a bit under what I expected from a Gemini Lake-equipped PC. And on the 3D Mark CloudGate benchmark test, we got a score of 2,953. And as you can see, its graphical performance on those two graphics tests was below that with what we saw out of the J4125-powered NUC box that we reviewed last week. And I think it's because the RAM on this one is configured in single channel mode versus dual channel mode. And that'll give you some disparity in the graphics performance, even with the same processor. And I also think there's probably some thermal throttling at play here as well. And we did run the 3D Mark stress test, which measures how well the computer does under load for an extended period of time. And there we got a failing grade of 87.5%. And you can see the temperatures that the system was generating during that test as well. Uh, so it will throttle, it will slow down in order to keep itself from getting too hot. 
and that, of course, will impact its overall performance. So I think this is going to be limited uh, mostly for web browsing and other light tasks. Getting into gaming and other things that really stress the processor will result in performance that doesn't quite meet what that processor inside is capable of due to the fact that it's got to get rid of the heat by slowing down. Now, one thing to keep in mind when you're using the device here is that it will get very warm to the touch even when it's sitting at idle. And the reason is, is that the entire case is a heat sink. That's the passive cooling at work. So it's definitely going to feel a bit warmer than other PCs you might have experienced, but that is mostly by design. Now, as expected, we were able to get Linux to work on this as well, and we booted up Ubuntu 20.10 here. Uh, we are running at 4K. We did have to go jump into the BIOS and poke around a little bit to get it to boot off the USB, but once that was done, we were good to go here. No problems. Audio is working. 4K display is working. We're scaling up to 200%. Uh, we also have audio and networking, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Everything seems to be performing as expected here. And again, the sweet spot's probably going to be 1080p for this, but it does look pretty nice here on Ubuntu at 4K scaled at 200%. So altogether, I do wish this performed a little better, but it's not bad if you're in an environment where you're not doing all that much strenuous work and you want something that will be relatively reliable. What I like about this as a former IT guy is that there's no moving parts in it at all. No fans to break. You've got Ethernet built right in. It's ready to go. You can plug it into a 1080p display and get decent performance for data entry tasks and word processing and email and that sort of thing. And I think that's what this is best suited for. The graphics performance is definitely not as good as it could be. I suspect if they did put 8 gigs of RAM in here and ran it in dual channel mode, it would do a little better. Uh, but this is not going to be a game playing device. It's not going to be a good home theater device either. So I think mostly the basics here is what this is designed for. And at 1080p, it should do the basics quite well. And it's a nice little package here that I think should uh, keep itself running pretty reliably, provided you've got a decent amount of passive airflow around it. That is going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.tv supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Jim Peter, Tom Albrecht, Frank Lewandowski, Mark Bollinger, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.